series called Where Are You Headed as a Church? And just as we were doing the worship, um, I really felt sensed of the idea of just to remind us in the room why it's important for us to think about the direction of our life. I don't know about you, but I look at the news and barely five minutes into it, and I'm already like just my, my heart and my soul is just awakened and provoked, not just for the disaster of today, but where our country is heading for tomorrow. And it's not just our country alone, we can see disasters across the world. And the importance of why it's, we need to reflect on it as individuals of where we are headed, because our decisions don't just affect us. In this room, we know that there's been parental decisions that affect us as children. There are decisions as a married couple that you will affect um, to one another. There are things that affect you as siblings. If you make a choice that affects your other um, sibling. There are loads of decisions that when we make it, it affects somebody else. And if you add that and multiply it in our society and in community, that one businessman's decision will affect the employers. One head teacher's decision will infect and impact the school. And so what I'd love us to do right now is to stand in prayer and to pray not only for our decision at the right off before we hear the message, but actually to pray for the decisions that are leading our society to pray for the government, for the leaders, for those in power and influence, that the decisions that they make that does have a ripple effect to so many more hundreds, if not thousands of people, that that will lead our country in the direction towards God, towards righteousness, towards purity, towards holiness, not towards disaster, greed, power, and selfishness. And what I'd love us to do, especially in this room, because this room, when I look out and even watching on the stage today, we have such an amazing blessing of a variety of experiences of who God has been in your life. You've got so much experience of who God has revealed himself to you, of a provider, of a healer, of a protector, of a redeemer, of a savior, as a friend. You have experienced that, and some of you, not just in this country. And the reason why I want to em emphasize that aspect is because I believe, and when we were just uh, worshiping together, is that some of you need to be reminded, or if not told for the first time, that you have not just stumbled into Teesside as a place, but that God has sent you here. And you might think, well, why has he sent me from Zimbabwe, from Nigeria, from the Philippines? We have people from all across the world, from Eritrea. Why has he sent me to Little Teesside? I believe he has sent you as a missionary to us because there are things that you're carrying as an embodiment of the presence from your country that he's saying, I need you to carry this and remind the people in the UK of who I am. You see, what's happened, and we see it in the Bible from one generation to the next, is we've had a generation that's gone before us that's forgot to tell their children. It's like they've done all the good lessons and the moral stories, but they have forgot to tell them who actually told them these stories, where those experiences and lessons came from. And so now we have an entire generation that's raised up that don't even know who Jesus is. Yeah. We're in a society that is supposed to be full of information, but no revelation. There's, there's no transformation that's taken place, and there's a pollution of noise that's taken. And what I would love, and I urge you, is when you come to Teesside, not only just to make this your home in the sense of what you're studying and your activities, but to realize you're a missionary sent by God. And will you not only come and serve, but you, will you tell your children and your children's children of who our God is? On the stage here, we also had two individuals that are first gen in the UK, so their parents are from another country, but they know who their God is, not just from their parents' faith, but it's their own faith as well. So can we just stand together as a church and let's just pray into this as the direction of where we're headed individually, as a society, as a community. Lord, will you hear our prayer this morning? We turn to you and we look to you and there is so much destruction, disaster, pain, hurting, grief. There is so much in this world that the devil has tried to come and steal and rob and destroy. But we turn to you, Jesus, as our life, as source, as the light of the world who will shine in the darkest places. And we pray that you will come and have your way. We pray that we will be surrendered in heart, soul, mind, body, strength, and in our daily decision making. And we pray will you go before us to our government, to the politicians, to the head 
head teachers, to the business leaders, to every sector in society of our community. And will you help them to have godly counsel, godly wisdom? Will you surround them with the Jeremiah's? Will you surround them with the Daniel's? Will you surround them with the Joseph's in their life that will speak the truth and direct them? Because we know there is a ripple and an impact and an influence that their decisions have on the rest of society. We pray that our 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 whole country will turn and repent towards you, God. That we know they're heading in one direction, but by hearing the hope and the message and the love of who you are, that they have been chosen, that they have been loved, that their life is valuable and meaningful, that God, that they will turn from their old ways, they will turn towards you. And Lord, we say, start with us. Start with us, we pray. And in this room, it will overflow and be a catalyst for change, not just for our families, not just for our church, not just for Teesside, but it will expand further and beyond. And we just think of our brothers and sisters in this room that you have sent here to, to be a missionary here for us. And we pray, Lord, that you will empower them, equip them as sent ones to us, we pray. Amen. 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 Are you ready for the word this God this morning? My title this morning is Keep It Real. Why don't you turn to someone and say, keep it real. Keep it real. How many of you in your morning routine this morning looked in the mirror? Oh, okay. I am someone that like, is that the first glare that you get yourself in the morning and you kind of like shock yourself and you're like, oh my days, how is my hair standing up like that? How would, I thought I'd... Re- took all my mascara off, but somehow still got panda eyes in the morning and all these things. Then you're like, okay, hopefully the shower will do miracles. And so then you get in the shower and you look up and up and you're like brushing your teeth. And there's a power of looking at your reflection. There's things that we don't get to see in ourselves without a mirror in life. And so what I'm hoping is this message becomes a little bit of a mirror to us that it can feel sometimes a bit of a, ooh, That was an interesting moment, but actually if we can keep it real to each other, we'll we'll see some journey of growth, okay? So my main point, I'm going to start off with the main point. I'm going to let you know basically what I'm going to talk to you about for the next half hour. So if you need to nap and you've come from a night shift, hear this, then nap, okay? So my main point is you are the hardest person to lead. In decision making, pay attention to tensions, ask good questions, and be honest with yourself. Did you know that every bad decision that has been made, every disaster that you have chosen, every, yeah, just bad little decision that you've made, it could just be by pressing the snooze button, it could have been going out to that party that you know you shouldn't have gone to, that you, yourself, have sold yourself on every bad decision. That actually it is us that have deceived ourselves into thinking that that was a good choice. Or is that just me? We know we sometimes have other voices of influence, but ultimately, we have made the decision, the conclusion, that that is a good thing or the thing that we're going to choose to do. Oh, I'll watch that film first, then I'll do my homework. I'll just have one more bite of cake, and then the whole thing is gone. For me, it's ice cream. I won't scoop it out and put it into the bowl. I'll just, have, I'll just get the spoon, I'll just eat a little bit, and then I don't realize until the whole tub of ice cream has gone that actually I've eaten way more than just a few spoonfuls. Proverbs 27, 12 has been a bit of a memory verse for us as a church throughout this series, and it says this, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. So Pastor Jonathan has been unpacking the idea and the importance of why we need to think about the paths that we choose in our life, the paths for our finances, the paths for our relationships, the paths for our careers, These old paths are leading us in a direction. And like I even said in the opening, our um, intentions don't give us, sorry, I didn't say that. Um, Intentions don't give us the direction of our life, but our decisions do. So we can all have a good intention that we mean to do well, that we mean to make the right choice. I had a really good intention in February to start off my fitness routine. But did any of my decisions lead towards a fitness routine? I can tell you I probably went on about five walks. That was it. Like, the, the decisions weren't leading me in that direction. So the intention was there, but actually, where am, I, where am I leading towards with that routine? 
The answer to life's problems we heard last week is not more information, but it is the solution is a person, and that person is Jesus. We do need to be well informed when we're making decisions, thinking about where we're heading, the paths that we're choosing, but ultimately we can have all the information, and we heard about the wisest man who lived on earth, King Solomon, who had all the information and still made silly choices. And so we can still make silly choices without the wisdom and the help from Jesus. So we've asked a few questions over the last few weeks. A couple of them was, what is the wise thing to do? And what story do I want to tell? And so hopefully those questions have really helped you and maybe penetrated in your mind and your heart over the last couple of weeks as you've had to make some decisions and maybe still thinking about what the outcome you need to make for some decisions that you're doing. So good questions set us up for good decisions. So I've got two more questions for you today. But before I go into the two questions that will hopefully help us to make good, godly, wise decisions, I'm going to read a scripture from Jeremiah 17. Um, We're going to read the first 10 verses, so you can join me there with your Bibles. So Jeremiah is a prophet in the Old Testament, and this is what he is saying to the people. Judah's sin is engraved with an iron tool, Inscribed with a flint point on the tablets of their hearts and on the horns of their altars. Even their children remember their altars and Asherah poles beside the spreading trees on the, on the high hills. My mountain in the land and your wealth in all your treasures, I will give away as plunder together with your high places because of your sin throughout the country. Though your own fault, you will lose the inheritance I gave you. I will enslave you to your enemies in the land you do not know. For you have kindled my anger and it will burn forever. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person is like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in the salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to their deed deserve. Bad news. Okay, should we get the bad news out of the way first? I don't know, when someone comes to you and they're like, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news, which do you want first? I always like, give me the bad news first. The bad news is that sin is engraved on our hearts. So that's like a real depth to it. And the idea where Jeremiah is saying, the heart is deceitful and it's beyond cure. So there's a difference between being dishonest and deceitful. Dishonesty is a bit easier to spot. Dishonesty isn't as clever. Maybe if you think of a dishonest person, you kind of maybe see it, but then you see the lies, you see that things don't tally up and you realize they're a dishonest person and you can't trust them. A deceitful person is so well masked that it's very hard, if not impossible, to see that you're being manipulated or something has been twisted. And they're so convincing and they, um, they can lie so easily and so well that you're deceived by what they're saying. And that's what he's saying that we're like with our, with our own hearts. We deceive, our hearts deceive us. And so it's interesting when you see so much on our social medias and in society and on the media that it'll be like, oh, follow your heart. (laughs) And like, I don't want to be that troll online, but I just want to kind of put all these scriptures and be like, don't follow your heart. Now, don't be like putting all these scriptures online because you need context and people need the love. But the idea is there that people in our world and in our society, they don't understand that Their pursuit of happiness, their pursuit of following their heart, they're deceiving themselves. And they are so convinced and wrapped up with their lies that actually they don't even realize the deceit that they're following. Let's take it away from outside this room. Let's bring it into us personally. There are are things that if we follow our heart, 
the things that maybe we think our heart is desiring, that we think is good for us, that if we follow it, we're deceiving ourselves that it's truly good for us. We're deceiving ourselves that it is good. Here's how our brain works. Our brain is clever enough to know that if we say to it, oh, I want that new top. The brain knows that we're not going to deceive ourselves and convince ourselves to buy that new top if we just want it. So it will rewire it from that place of desire to say, I need that new top. Because it knows that from that need, that place, that actually you will then act upon it. And so that's the way that we justify it to ourselves is, well, it's not that I want, it's that I need that top for that occasion. Um, I liked the idea of justifications are just lyings. Um, and I thought it's quite a nice play on words. So Jeremiah says it's beyond cure. So that idea that it's a permanent condition. So it's not something that we grow out of. It's not something that we can mature out of. But actually, there's a permanent condition where our hearts try to deceive us. Day in, day out, without a cure. We don't grow out of it. And we've got to, therefore, put it under constant supervision. And we've got to be proactive of how we respond to our heart. The question that Jeremiah asks when he says this is, well, who can understand it? I don't know about you, but I've often asked myself of like, I don't understand why I decided to do that. You know, there's things where you kind of, you make choices and then you look back in hindsight and go, I don't understand why I decided to do that. But at the moment, your heart is deceiving yourself that that is a good choice, that is a good path to take. So there's the bad news, okay? That the sin is engraved in our hearts and that our heart is deceitful and beyond cure. Are you ready for the good news? Okay, the good news is in 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, we can read about a new covenant in scripture that is written on our hearts. It says this, it is clear that Christ himself wrote this letter and sent it by us. It is written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God and not on stone tablets, but on human hearts. I think there's such a powerful imagery and you've got to know that the writers of um, Corinthians, which is um, Paul, he knows what Jeremiah has written. He understands the, the power of this symbolism of going, okay, we know that sin is engraved on our hearts, but Jesus has made a way that actually we can have um, a new letter written on our heart. We can have new ink written on our hearts and new tablets, the tablets referring to the Ten Commandments of Moses, saying we can have a new word written on our hearts. And the cure, well, in Colossians 2.14, it says, Jesus canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. We just sang that, Jesus, once and for all, didn't we? Jeremiah 17.9 then, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? My urge for us as we try to keep it real this morning is that we acknowledge we are the most hardest person to lead in our life. It's easy to give advice and to tell someone, oh, you should do this, but to actually apply it in our life and to acknowledge our blind spots, to acknowledge of, um, what we struggle with, it, it's really hard because our heart ourselves is deceiving ourselves and lying to ourselves. And so what I want to encourage us to do is to look at ourselves in the mirror this week and to be brutally honest, to keep it real and to be honest. And here's the controversial thing I'll say, even if it makes you feel bad about yourself. Can you tell the truth to yourself? Keep it real about what is going on. The habit of telling ourselves the truth, the uncomfortable truths about why you choose to do what you choose to do, could, it will help us in our decision making. Keeping it real. So here's my first question for us. Am I being honest with myself? If you want to justify your decisions to other people, that's fine, okay. But there's no win in justifying your decisions to yourself. You, you don't win in that scenario. So could you be honest in a one-on-one -on -one conversation in the mirror this week 
and say, am I being honest with myself in this choice, in this decision that I'm pursuing? Am I being honest with myself? And when you ask yourself that question, and you're willing to be uncomfortable and brutally honest, even if it makes you feel a bit bad about yourself, pause and then go, really? Am I being honest about myself? Really? Sometimes we can say what we think we know we should be saying to ourselves. So take a pause and then go, really? I did it this week. I am talking to you from experience. And I looked at myself in the mirror and went, really? You know that that's probably not the smartest, wisest choice. It was uncomfortable. It was awkward. Looking at myself going, you know better. You're giving yourself a justified reason of, yes, okay, like it's not bad to do. Some of our choices, it's not sinful. They're not bad to do. But being honest with yourself, you know it's not the best choice for yourself. And you're going, really? There's a story where Jeremiah, the same prophet who wrote the scripture that we just read from, he was the advisor to kings. And I guess the privilege you have as a king is you can listen to the advice or you don't have to take on board the advice. And you see in Second Chronicles um, just a list of at least three kings, if not more, where they hear Jeremiah's words and disregard them, throw them out. And so at the time, um, there's particularly um, King Jehoiakim, Kim, um, he, was, um, he did so much evil. Um, Jeremiah was trying to advise him, saying, no, please don't do the, like, the military of where you're paying to kind of get your support from. Don't change that, because that's going to have real big implications, um, particularly because they knew of a brutal king, King Nebuchadnezzar, and that's going to make you really vulnerable. And he didn't listen. He was greedy, and he just went on his own way. When he realized the disaster that was happening, because King Nebuchadnezzar surrounds the entire um, uh, community and until starvation, until they surrender, and he's kind of then going to Jeremiah going, can you help me? And he's going, it's too late, I warned you, but this is the consequences of your choices. And remember, our decisions don't just impact us, they impact other people. And so then King Nebuchadnezzar comes in, and he had a really weird thing that he liked collecting. I don't know if any of you are into collections, uh, collecting coins, if you collect... I don't know what else do people collect. They used to collect stamps once upon a time. Um, but I know coins is a big one. This king decided that he would collect other kings. So that was his little thing that he would enjoy doing. And he was very brutal. He was an evil man. He would blind the kings and he would take them to their palace. And then if he would have a party, he would parade the kings around. And they would all have to walk around with one um, arm on each shoulder and like walk around like really weird, uh, awful things. And that's what he opened up to because Jeremiah was giving him advice and he didn't listen. And you see it from the next king to the next king. Basically, he would take one king and put your family member in place. And then that family member needs to do what you, you say, which is also evil. And if you don't do it, then he takes you as a collection. And if you do do it, well, for one of the kings, 11 years later, he still takes you and collects you as another king as part of his little weird enjoyment. Second Chronicles 26.12 says about uh, King Jehoiakim, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord and um, his God and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke the word of God. We could hear a story like that and go, what was King Jehoiakim thinking? Like, why did he make that choice? Like, why did he not listen to Jeremiah? And Jeremiah explains it to us in Jeremiah 17 that the idea that we're actually very good at self-deception. We're very good at selling ourselves on bad options. So this week, can we have a heart-to-heart -heart with ourselves and begin to actually be honest about why we're making the choices that we're making? I've got a list of a few questions and um, maybe some of them will resonate with you. Maybe none of them will resonate with you. But maybe it will trigger another question for you to think, am I being honest with myself about, and then fill in the blank with this question. And see if you're selling yourself on truth or you're selling yourself on regret. So why do you continue to go out with him or her? Really? Why did you really 
file for divorce? Why are you taking that job? Why are you quitting that job? Why did you move in? Really? What is the real reason you don't call your mum or dad? Why don't you tell them the truth about what's really going on? Why did you leave that church? Why do you keep missing Connect Group? Really? Why do you continue to drink? Why do you continue to smoke? What is the real reason you don't tithe? Now really, what is the real reason? Be honest with yourself. Why do you keep sliding into those DMs? Why do you keep watching pornography? Why are you going to study that subject at university? What is the real reason that you want to move there and live there? Why do you keep skipping exercise? Why don't you read the Bible? Really? Why don't you pray? Really? It's brutal, isn't it? It's hard. It's terrifying. <laughs> but it's clarifying and ultimately liberating and empowering if we can face ourselves in the mirror and go, am I being honest with myself? Really? If you want to justify it to other people for the time being, okay. But you don't justify it to yourself. Be honest with the person in the mirror. Like Michael Jackson said, start with the man in the mirror. Let's look at ourselves this week. Be honest with yourself. Good things don't come to us naturally. We default to rot, not to health. And I think the sobering thought for us is even if we think we are mature in Christ and you've got a lot of the good habits all together and you've made so many incredible good decisions in your life and you've sacrificed so much for God and you have had lots of wise godly counsel, the sobering thought for us is we're only ever one bad decision away from disaster. And so if our heart is uncurable in that sense, then we need to keep it in check. We need to keep examining our hearts. Every decision we make going, am I being honest with myself, really? John 8, 30 says, Jesus spoke to those who believed in him. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Okay, so that's my first question. Am I being honest with myself? My second question is, why are people who have too much to drink inclined to make bad decisions? Okay, you've heard the stories. Some of them can be quite funny in hindsight of when someone's had too much to drink and the random decisions that they've made. Some of them can actually be quite tragic and be quite, the consequences can be really big. And I've never, ever heard a story that's gone, oh, it was a good thing I was drunk. Otherwise, I might have made a really bad decision. Okay, so you might be thinking, Faith, what does this really have to do with me? Well, the implications if you get drunk is kind of obvious, but the implications for those that don't drink or don't get drunk, here's the implication for us. While drunk and intoxicated people can't pay attention to their internal clues because literally when you're drunk on alcohol, the um, psychology shows us that there's, um, I, I can't even pronounce it, the neuropineprene in the brain acts like a stimulant and so it increases the impulsivity to maybe just go for it and not think about it. It's like there's no fear and so there's less sensibility um, of the understanding the consequences of a decision. Also, alcohol temporarily impairs the activity of the frontal cortex. So that literally means that your brain is not able to connect the dots. Um, so just what we heard last week when my dad said that certain parts of our brain hasn't fully developed till we're 20, 21. It's the same part of that brain that just disconnects when you drink an alcohol. So you might think, okay, um, that makes sense with the alcohol conversation, but that's not my story, Faith. That doesn't make sense for me. Well, the same way that drunk people can't pay attention to those clues of what's going on in our brain and in our conscience, sober people can often be guilty of ignoring it. 
Just ignoring the external and internal cues that are going on to say, oh, is this a good decision? So here's my real question. That was just a fake question. Here's my real question. Is there a tension that deserves my attention? See, drunk people can't help themselves, but we often won't help ourselves. And there's a difference. Will we decide to make the choice to look at moments that can be like red flags in dating? And you see a few warning signs, red flags, and you just keep ignoring it. You don't ask those hard, tough questions. And you just keep on going. I heard a great quote. It said, those that you date can become your partner. So let's just say, um, you know, if I'm dating a guy, then he could become my husband. Your husbands then become fathers. It's important of who you date because there is a, literally a, a line that goes on. If you don't pay attention to those red flags. There's so often things that ding in our, in our consciousness that if we don't just pause for a moment and reflect on and pay attention to it let, it, let it bother you in a way. Just let that tension get your attention. That's a, a tongue twister, I know. Let the tension get your attention and let it be a bit of a moment for you to go, oh, what's being alerted here? What's going on? For time's sake, um, I've got an example from 1 Samuel 24. You can read it in your own time. But in 1 Samuel 24, the first seven verses, we read about how David has a tension spot moment. So David, as a young shepherd's boy, has been anointed to be king. So he knows that calling on his life, that he is to be the future king. And there is a king called Saul, and he ends up um, being part of Saul's family because he kills Goliath and, um, and being part of the family. And then Saul gets jealous of him and then tries to kill him. And there's, so David's on the run in this part of the story. And David is hiding out with some of his men in a cave. And as it would happen, as Saul is trying to pursue David to kill him, Saul needs the toilet. A very, you know, human thing to need. And so he sees a cave and thinks, oh, I'll just go in there. When he goes into the cave, David, with his men, see an opportunity. The king is without his armor, without his protection, that he could easily take his life. And so the men around David are saying to him, go on, do it. Kill a king and become king. And so David goes towards the king to go and kill him. But then a conscious moment takes place and he just cuts a bit of the garment instead. The scripture tells us that there's a conscious moment and David doesn't ignore that conscious moment, but he pays attention to it. And here's what David is paying attention to. Like we heard a few weeks ago, what story do I want to tell? When I have children and grandchildren, they go, Granddad, Granddad, tell us again how you became king. That's the story he's going to tell. Where the story he actually gets a chance to tell, you can read in 1 Samuel 13, which is more of one where God has ordained the right time in and one that he can boastfully, excitedly talk about. I think the other thing that David acknowledges in his conscious moment is that just because you kill the king does not mean you become king. I wonder if sometimes there's an element of where we think we can predict our own future. But that's where disappointment comes, right? Because we think we can predict our own future. So we can't ignore the tensions because we think we can predict or how the outcome is going to come. You know, if, if David followed through in that moment and killed Saul, he would have been surrounded with lots of cheers, of clapping, of encouragement from his men. But really, his men don't know the real outcome. Some of the voices in our life might be cheering us on to do something, but they, uh, they think you're going in a direction, but they don't. They can't predict your future. I think what's interesting for David is David is unique. We're not going to be in a cave with Saul making that decision. But his direction is not. The same for us, that you are unique, your story is unique, some of the decisions you've got to make are unique, but the direction that you're going is not. And in fact, probably like Jeremiah has tried to warn so many people about the decisions that he's going to make, I bet some people have already warned you about the decision that you're going to make. 
Good counselors know that there's no solution or fix, but there's just a direction that we go in. The solution ultimately is to change the direction, and that is a process. For us this morning, my prayer is through these questions, yes, we'll be provoked, we'll feel a bit uncomfortable, but it's not for us to think, oh, that's a quick fix, that's a solution, but for us to go on a process of a new direction, a new journey in our decision-making and our choices. So let me remind us what Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? God can understand it. Will we bring our decision-making process into his presence and let him examine our hearts? Reveal to us things that we may not have realized or even remembered and that he can bring to the forefront. I am the hardest person to lead in my decision making. I need to pay attention. I need to ask good questions and I need to be honest in myself. You, for yourself, you are the hardest person to lead. In decision making, will you pay attention to the tensions Ask good questions and be honest with yourself. When Jesus gives an invitation for us to follow him, there's an invitation for him to be Lord and Savior. The good news of him as our Savior is that we can fully know without changing our direction that we are loved. That he has created you, he loves you, he's placed a value on your life. And that is the place where Jesus is going, no matter what your story is, I love you. And for some of you today, you need to receive Jesus as your savior. And to know that even though our heart is so deceptive, and that there has been so many bad decisions you've made, he still loves you. He cares about you. And you can receive that love and choose to follow him as your savior. You can choose to love him back. You can choose to worship him. But here's the kind of crux of it. If Jesus is our savior, he's also our Lord. And the Lord is the idea that we, yes, have been saved but we are being saved. We have been set free, but we are being set free. That is the salvation and the sanctification. There is a moment of salvation where you say yes to Jesus as your savior. But him being Lord is a daily thing of walking with him, of letting him be honest with you, (laughs) of letting him point out the tensions in your life that don't align with his teachings and his word. But that comes after you knowing him as his savior. So I'm going to pray and the worship team are going to come back up in a moment. But before I pray, will you just grab your connect cards out and um, write down which question you are going to face to yourself in the mirror this week. Maybe it's both of them. Maybe it's another question that I read out or another one that came to your mind. And you be honest with yourself, really. Will you pay attention to the tensions? What's your your step this week? How are you going to look at yourself in the mirror this week? What difference will this make to your decision-making process? If you've got prayer requests that stem from that, please feel free to put that down as well. And if you would like to say yes to Jesus as being your Lord and your Savior for the first time, or maybe this is just you recommitting your heart again, I'm going to say a prayer in the moment, and then you can tick that on the Connect card, and one of the team will reach out to you as well. So let us pray, shall we? Jesus, we thank you for your love and your kindness and your mercy and your generosity towards us. We thank you that your goodness pursues us all the days of our life. We thank you that you are relentless in the way that you love us and that your love is unconditional. And today, we receive your love. We thank you that you have placed such a value in our life that you have died for us, that you paid the ultimate debt for our sins, the sins that were engraved on our heart. 
And I thank you, God, that you have engraved new promises on our heart, a new covenant on our heart. And we pray that we will follow you, not just as our Savior, but also as our Lord. Will you have your way in our life? Renew us each day. Will your perfect love cast out fear? Cast out the fear of being honest with ourselves. Cast out the fear of facing the tensions. Let your love come down, we pray. Amen.